5. I am going to jump a little bit ahead of Brother Matt. I'm going to get to his verses before he does, since he's, uh, he's working his way through 1 Thessalonians, and we are in chapter 5. But I didn't really plan it that way. It's just it's been something I've been thinking about for a while. And, and uh, sitting here on the platform this morning, I go, oh, yeah, <laughs> Brother Matt is almost here. Well, I'll get my first shot at these verses. I'll leave him the gleanings, amen. He'll, he'll, uh, he'll, he'll get stuff out of the corners, and there'll be plenty there. I trust, uh, I trust you know that. Um, and so in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, I want to uh, look at verse number uh, 23, if you will. Uh, let me get this settled here. Hang on one second. All right. Okay, uh, verse number 23. The Bible says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Uh, and, uh, and I pray, God, uh, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. What a tremendous uh, thought we have here, and Brother Matt actually touched on it from, the, from earlier in the chapter, and so it served as a good introduction uh, to the chapter, or to what I'm going to be preaching today, that he, that he touched on that, is, is that we are looking forward to the coming of our Lord, amen? We are not appointed to wrath. We are uh, looking for the, the resurrection of the dead, and then uh, also the rapture of the saved, and notice some things about this, but uh, I want to get to, we're not going to stray very far from these verses because uh, really, you know, I thought about starting back in verse number 15 or so, uh, but I know that uh, that's getting back into s- some overlap and we'll, we'll uh, be a little more exhaustive. And so I want to be a little more focused this morning on this idea that I've been uh, touching on since the beginning of the, the calendar year. And that is our consecration to the Lord. And uh, take uh, the thought from verse number 23 that, uh, we, that the prayer is that, that Paul, that uh, is being asked here, is that God would sanctify them wholly. Amen? Not H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly, completely. And the idea of complete or total sanctification or consecration. You say, what's the difference between consecration and sanctification? Not really much. Sanctification is something that uh, is often done to you. Consecration is something you choose to do. Although we often, the Bible often uses the term sanctification uh, in terms of something we are to do. We are to sanctify ourselves uh, as unto the Lord. And so, um, it's not, it's not completely that way. And so it's, there's really not much difference between the two. And, uh, and we get the idea of in, from verse 22, where he says, even abstain from all appearance of evil, not just, but you know, there's this notion in the broad realm of Christianity that, uh, you know, that, you know, back in the Old Testament, they were under the law, but today we're under grace. And so under grace, you can kind of, uh, the, the standards are kind of let down a little bit. That you can kind of, you know, let your hair down a little bit. You kind of, uh, you know, you don't have to be as, as worried about, about the details of the Christian life. And, uh, and that you can, you know, just, just uh, uh, be a little more casual about your Christian life. But I find that grace calls us not to a lower standard, but a higher standard. I think it's illustrated, and I've used this illustration multiple times, but I think it's illustrated in the fact where Jesus said, you've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if a man looks on a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery already in his heart. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a higher standard, not a lower standard. So under the law, they could stop short of killing someone. But under grace, God says, you shouldn't even hate them. 
uh, that's a higher standard, not a lower standard. And so uh, I believe that in Christ, uh, consecration or sanctification calls us to a higher standard, not a, a lower one. And so uh, in this passage of Scripture, just in these few verses, I want to talk about complete sanctification. Complete sanctification. You say, well, now wait a minute, preacher. Uh, we're not going to be perfect until we see the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is true. But that does not mean that we cannot seek to be completely sanctified unto the Lord. It is God's determination uh, in Jesus Christ to present us perfectly sanctified. You say, well, preacher, now wait just a minute. But I can, I've got Bible to prove it. You know, I don't, I'm not afraid when I've got a Bible verse to back me up. Amen. If I'm on my own, I'm just winging it. I'm a little nervous. But uh, when I've got a Bible verse to back me up, I'm not, not too nervous. And in Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says Jesus uh, gave himself for the church that he might present it to himself, a spotless church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And I know that's going to happen. You say, well, that happens through his strength and his power, yes. And he is working in us even today toward that sanctification. And so we have this, this uh, truth that is presented to us in verse number 23, that the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, completely, or absolutely, and then that he might preserve, we might be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I will not overcome all sin in this life or in this world. But there's no kind of sin that can't be overcome. There's nothing that I can point to and say, well, that's just a bridge too far. That's just a little bit beyond my reach. Or that's, uh, God knows that we're but dust. And so, uh, so he doesn't really expect me to do that. No, no, God expects us to be sanctified holy. That's what he desires of us. And so there is no kind of sin that I cannot get victory over while it is clear also that I will not get victory over every sin until Jesus comes. You say, well, how do you balance those out? What does that mean for us? It means we can never stop striving, but realizing that we're always going to continue to need God's help and forgiveness when we fall short. And, uh, and, and it, is in the, it is in the labor to sanctify ourselves that we fall short and we need God's grace. And so let's just consider the nature of sanctification. Sanctification or consecration, we can say it, it, there are two important facets or parts of it. Number one is the dedication. We must determine to give ourselves to the Lord. The Bible uses the word yield. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto death, but we are to yield our, our, our members as instruments of righteousness unto life, unto Christ. That is a conscious choice on our part. If we are honest with ourselves, and, and sensitive to the working of the Holy Spirit, we will admit that there are struggles in, our, in ourselves between the flesh and the Spirit. You see, the Apostle Paul, when he admits that, he does not identify himself as the worst among, among men, but rather as a... a uh, um, an example among men. When he said, the things I know I shouldn't do, I do. The things I know I should not do, that's what I do. And he described the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. And there are often struggles between the flesh and the spirit. Between, you say, well, uh, well, I don't struggle with uh, the certain kinds of immorality. I've gotten victory over that. But that doesn't mean that that's all the sin there is. 
You see, every sin comes from the base sin of pride. And when we think that we have achieved something, we're probably guilty of more than we, than we think. When we think that we are, have, have arrived where the Apostle Paul said, not that I have apprehended. I've not yet achieved. I've not arrived at the state of perfection, but I press toward the mark. You never are supposed to yield or give up. And so we need to be dedicated. He is ready for any use. That person who commits himself to Christ is ready for any use that God may put him to. And he gives God the glory for it. The sanctified man is dedicated to God. That means it has been publicly surrendered to God for his purpose and his use. You know, there's a lot of that in the Christian life where we are publicly setting ourselves apart for Christ. When we make a public declaration of our faith in Christ, we are publicly setting ourselves apart unto the Lord. And through our life and through our uh, service to Christ, in sharing Christ with others, we are publicly putting ourselves uh, uh, for his use. But in, in addition to uh, dedication, there's also then the carrying out of it, which is actual purification. Purification. Now, it's, that is the work that God does in us to make us more like Jesus Christ. That is where he takes our willingness to dedicate ourselves and he puts us to use. The, the act of, of sanctifying would be to, to have a ceremonial setting apart of a piece of, of pottery or a utensil or whatever it might be, a piece of furniture for God to use. But the purification then takes place to rid it of any connection with the world. And to purify ourselves, to walk in purity and holiness and godliness. The great hindrance to our consecration of ourselves to God and to any divine purpose is sin in our life. You say, well, I, no, I, I'm way past all that, preacher. Oh, really? Uh, all you have to do, you know, uh, some of our soul winners uh, here like to go back to uh, Exodus 20 to the Ten Commandments when we're dealing with somebody about sin. And, uh, you know, maybe we ought to do that ourselves once in a while just to have a check on ourselves. Because the fact of the matter is there are many things in the Bible that are described as sinful that we classify as not very sinful. The Bible commands us, for instance, to put away bitterness. And if we're bitter about something with somebody else, we typically give ourselves a pass that we're justified in our bitterness because we were wronged. And the fact is, we may have been. But that, doesn't, that does not uh, um, satisfy the question of whether or not we are harboring bitterness in our heart. I'm so glad that God, who is our example in all things, does not hold bitterness in his heart against me because when he forgives he forgives and wipes the slate clean he says your sin will i remember no more which means i will not bring it up for remembrance i won't remind you of it it's not that and i listen i grew up hearing that you know when uh, when you get saved god gets amnesia he doesn't know what sins you've committed and, and it hit me one day that if God doesn't know what sins I've committed, then he's not omniscient. He must know the sins I've committed. The problem is we typically, we like to get our theology not from the Bible. We like to get our, our theology from music. And so we, heard, we remember hearing the gospel quartet saying, what sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore anymore. Uh, and, uh, and so God doesn't remember our sins. He has amnesia. I've heard preachers say, God has amnesia about my sin. No, he does not. He just has made me a promise that he will not remind me of it. He's not going to bring it up because it is forgiven. And what a tremendous help that is to me. Because I have a hard time 
forgetting what someone has done. But I can follow the example of God and never bring it up. I can just say, you know what? If it's been confessed, if it's been put under the blood, uh, then I will not remind you of it. I'll not bring it up for remembrance. So purification. That is our walk with the Lord. Our, uh, where the Bible says if you want to uh, overcome the works of the flesh, you simply walk in the Spirit. The Bible says in the book of Galatians, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You can't do both. Our problem is we often are not walking in the Spirit. Too many Christians are like the man from whom the demons were cast out, but because he was left empty and he did not fill himself with godly things, those demons came back with more demons. And too often we do not replace worldliness with godliness. We do not replace sin with holiness. We do not begin to walk in the spirit. When we stop walking in the flesh, it leaves a vacancy because we have not filled our life with walking in the spirit. In what area are we to be sanctified? Well, here in verse number 23 of our text, the Bible says, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit, and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does he mean when he says, I, I want you to be sanctified holy? He means in these aspects, body, soul, and spirit. Now, it is not as easy as one might think to distinguish between body, soul, and spirit or excuse me, between soul and spirit. Because very often, not only does the Bible use it interchangeably, apparently, but also we use it interchangeably, apparently. But I do find, and, and very often, where both are in one context like this. So there must be some sort of distinction between the two. And I believe what God is saying here, in a nutshell, is when he says, sanctify you holy." He means truly. You say, well, don't you mean thoroughly? No, I mean truly. The word truly means through and through. Absolutely, completely, which seems to grammatically be more thorough than thoroughly. The Bible talks about the word of God is sufficient to satisfy the requirements for, for service for God that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. There are some editions even of the King James Bible where I wonder sometimes uh, if it hasn't been snuck in there by computers. You know, how, you ever know how you're, you know, when you're texting something and you, you, you text it real quick or you talk to text real quick or whatever and you hit send and then you look at what you send and it changed it. And sometimes it's embarrassing. It is embarrassing. I was on my way over one time to Brother Klitsky's house. I was running a little bit late and I was on the back roads. And as I was going along, there was some deer that ran across the road in front of me. And I slammed on the brakes and, and had to slide sideways and front ways and backwards and not hit them. And, and, uh, and as I did that, I didn't, uh, I used hands free, all right, uh, but I talked to text and I said, I'm running late if I can keep from hitting these dumb deer. And I sent it. I got to Brother Klitsky's house. I didn't, I didn't even look at it because I just talked to text and it sent it. I got to Brother Klitsky's house and I, I walked up on the porch there and, and, uh, and uh, he knew I was coming, so I just kind of knocked on the door a little bit and opened the door. And he's standing in the kitchen, Brother Josh, right there by the, by the door. And he is laughing so hard he could not breathe. And I'm like, okay, what's funny? 
And he's just, and he can't breathe. He can't tell me because he can't breathe. Every time he starts to, he starts laughing again, gasping for breath. And this goes on for several minutes. And finally, after several minutes, he finally, he can't stop. So he just sets his phone down on the counter and points at it. And it's my text to him. And it did not say those dumb deer. It changed it to a swear word. And what he was laughing about was he knew that I didn't say that. <laughs> but he also knew that when I saw it, uh, I was going to be very embarrassed. And, of course, and so he, 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 you know, I had to do CPR on him and, and uh, get him no, no, no mouth to mouth, just, you know, uh, just wanted to pound on his chest a little bit. And, uh, you know, sometimes the computers change things. To what, and, I, and I don't know if that's what's happened with some of the some uh, editions of the King James Bible. But there in Timothy, it won't say thoroughly. It says thoroughly. The, well, there is a difference. There, the, grammatically, there are two distinct words. We are thoroughly uh, prepared to serve God. And I believe God wants us sanctified thoroughly. Through and through. It is, it is, it is more complete, evidently, even than thoroughly. Uh, what does this mean in body, soul, and spirit? Well, let me try to, to help. First of all, the body is easy to identify. And it is, uh, it is the, the body is where the uh, lusts of our flesh are. Uh, it's, it is, it is where, uh, there is a, a connection, uh, material connection to this world. It is where we interact with this world through sight and taste and touch. It is, it is those things that, that Satan often uses in the Christian life to draw him away from spiritual things because of the, uh, lust of the flesh. And God wants our flesh, our body, to be so uh, holy, throughly sanctified. There is no room for a, a little bit of Christian sin. There is the people say, well, you know, as long as you're saved, then that makes that holy. You can't sanctify that which is in a, in, inherently unholy by touching it with something holy. As a matter of fact, the opposite happens. That which is holy is made unclean. And so you, you don't make a sin uh, by, you don't, you don't make uh, uh, ungodly music godly by putting a few Christian lyrics to it. It's still Satan's music. The same thing with, uh, with uh, immorality. It's not made clean because it is between uh, saved people. It, is, it just makes the saved people unholy. We need to understand that God wants our, our body sanctified. And then he says, not only our body, but he mentions also our spirit and our soul. When the, when the two are mentioned together, I typically, they, they do overlap slightly. But I typically understand them this way. That the soul is the being of man. It is the life of man. The Bible says when God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, man became a living soul. So the fact that you are a sentient, conscious being, and that that being is eternal in nature going forward, it will never end, that is, I believe, what is referred to typically as the soul. Although it does carry some of the characteristics of the heart of man. But the spirit. The spirit is also an immaterial part of man. But it describes many times more our thought process. Our, our personality. Rather than just existing. We are an individual. And that individual part is... What I find is often described by the word spirit. 
And so we are, uh, it's like some will have a, a spirit of, of, uh, of godliness and some a spirit of worldliness. It is more their temperament. It is more their personality. It is more their attitude rather than simply their existence. But however you mix these two, however you define soul and spirit, it is clear, this one thing is clear, that the combination of the two comprise the whole of immaterial man. That everything you are that is not physical falls under the category of spirit and soul. That means this. That every part of man, there is no corner of man that God does not desire to be sanctified. There is no little corner that we reserve for ourselves. Someone said, I uh, was reading uh, just a while back, uh, you know, I, I, try to, I try to include reading. I, I seldom can get through entire books but I'll come across a, a portion of a book and I'll read two or three chapters of interest to me. And I was recently uh, reading through a book and it was talking about that every man is really multiple people. You know, you, you know the person that other people think you to be. Um, and then the, the, public, the public thinks you to be. The, the person that those close to you think you to be. And then there's the person that you think you to be. Then there's the little corner that you reserve and nobody else gets to see into. Well, I'll just go say this. There's the man that God knows us to be, which is more intimate than anything else. But it was almost making an excuse. This little section that's, that's just you. It wasn't giving excuse to harbor sin there, but it was, it was almost excusing that. That there's this little place where, and this is your safe place. No, listen, there is no place that the eye of God does not see. There is no place that we ought to think that we can just hide or harbor sin. Because the truth of the matter is, God knows all things. When we start feeling, as Paul said, the draw to think or act in a way that is unbecoming a child of God... And when we begin that battle with the flesh, when we uh, begin to tell ourselves how justified we are because of how wronged we've been and how hurt, uh, how much hurt has been caused, and all of that may be true, but God still desires us to be sanctified, holy, body, soul, and spirit. Now, what is the source of our sanctification? Is it our own efforts? Well, God does desire us to sanctify ourselves, but really, notice what it says, the very God of peace sanctify you holy. It is calling upon God to do the work. Paul turns from exhortation to prayer. Here and there, little duties are directed by our own will and energy, but the great work of sanctification of purification, of consecration, must be the work of God in our life. In other words, we must allow God to work in us. We often approach God as, we, as if we have to beg God to do something in us. When that is not, when that is not Bible. I, I read a whole book uh, recently. Well, I'm almost done with the book. I've read almost the whole book on what revival is not. What revival is not. The things that people think revival is. And that, that there's no Bible basis for it. There's that, that, that this, this author, this preacher, is basically saying a lot of the things that we preach about revival today, they're not in the Bible. And uh, they're, they're made up by men. And how true it is that oftentimes we fail to look to the Bible for our doctrine. And the Bible says that that sanctification is ultimately the work of a holy God. And we just simply let him or allow him the access to our life where he desires to work. We don't have to beg him or talk him into it. He wants to. He wants to preserve us holy, blameless, 
under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This, this is all in preparation for the coming of Christ. Now let me say this, and I want to I try to, to um, explain something that I don't know if it needs explanation. Because I don't know your heart and your mind. There, there's coming a day of judgment of the lost. That the Bible talks about that the lost will stand at the great white throne of judgment. And there will be all kinds of men there, but one thing in common, that they're unsaved, unredeemed. There will be wicked men there. There will be religious men there. But they're going to give an account of the fact that they have not accepted Christ as their Savior at the great white throne of judgment. And there is a judgment day for the saved. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says that that judgment seat of Christ is a place where our service for Christ will be judged. And uh, and the loss there will not be uh, an eternal loss of the presence of God. It is not losing the the, uh, opportunity to be with him forever. But rather the loss there is of, the potential loss there is of crowns for our service to Christ. And so our service to Christ will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ, whether the things we've done uh, are for his honor and for his glory, and if they have been, we'll receive crowns and lay them at the feet of Jesus because he alone is worthy of praise. If our works have not been, we simply will not receive those rewards. You say, well, wait a minute, preacher. What about, the, what about our sins today? Uh, and that's where people often get into that, listen, once you get saved, you don't ever have to worry about what you do because if you do sin, uh, and they say sometimes, I read, I read a, a book one time, or a booklet one time, where a guy was saying, well, even if you do sin, which is highly unlikely. Even if you do sin, you don't have to worry about it because he's already paid for it, it's already taken care of. But it leaves out a whole lot of Bible. And here's what I believe we need to understand. While the penalty of our sin has been taken care of, we'll not have to spend eternity in hell. And while the judgment seat of Christ, which is the next uh, event, right, it's right after the rapture, which is the next event where there's going to be an accounting, and that is for our service for Christ. What about the sins that we commit on a day-to-day basis when we don't get victory in our life? And I believe the answer is in this, that God is judging or dealing with our sins of the Christian in real time. That, we are, that he deals with us now. He convicts us now. And if we confess and forsake our sins, he is faithful just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we do not, then he will chasten us as he does children. Amen? Hebrews chapter number 12. That he'll chasten us as a father does his children. He's dealing with our sins in current time. So that when we get, stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, that's no longer a judgment of our sins because the penalty of our sins has been dealt with. The reality and presence of our sins, God is dealing with now as we uh, uh, walk through this world and we either have the blessings of God or forfeit those blessings and receive the chastening of the Lord. And now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. Amen? I remember growing up as a, as a, a preteen thinking that could, there could not possibly be one verse in the Bible that's more true than that. Hmm. No chastening seemeth to be joyous, amen? Uh, it, it was not fun being chastened by mom and dad. And so I believe that we are being chastened uh, in real time, that God is dealing with our sins as we go along now. And when God presents us, he will do so blameless, holy, Preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we are, listen, as children, we are chastened when we do wrong. Why? So that we can be corrected. Corrected means set on the right path. And so, once God has dealt with us, he's convicted us, we've confessed it, he's, he has forgiven it and made us clean, there's nothing more about that sin to judge. 
Think about it, what a wonderful thing it is that God is sanctifying us through uh, his chastening, through his word, he is sanctifying us. Now notice this in verse number 24. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. God performs what he promises. He is true to his word. He is true to his children. God is faithful. What a tremendous notion it is that, listen, we are on this way, this path of sanctification. Yes, he's calling us to it. Yes, he wants us to surrender to it. But it is he that is doing the work. And he does so willingly. He does so desiring to make us clean. And when he chastens us as his child and makes us clean, oh, what a tremendous thing it is that we can walk with him and have a clear conscience, not have anything that we know of that's hindering us. By the way, if there's something, God will let you know. God will let you know. I read recently the testimony of a, an old uh, uh, Irish or Scottish, I don't remember which, and in my mind there, I, I know they would disagree with that, but with this, but uh, they're, they're similar to me. Uh, it might have been a Scottish, an old Scottish pastor, and he was asking a, a, an elderly lady in his church. And he said, no, and I, I couldn't read the, it was, what I read was actually in their, you know, their, um, with their accent and everything. And I can't do that justice, so I won't even try. And I'll just shorten it and abbreviate it for you this morning. And the old pastor was talking to this elderly lady, an old saint, uh, been saved for many years. And he asked her the question, something like this. What if, after all that God has done for you, in the end, he still allowed you to go to hell? And her response was that he has more to be ashamed of than I do then. And he said, the pastor said, well, how is it that God could have something to be ashamed about? She said, because it's he that promised, and yet, and I that just believed. She's like, how could God, she, she, she recognizes that everything that she's hoping in is, is in the promise and the faithfulness of God to his word. Oh, listen, we can always depend upon the faithfulness of God and what a tremendous truth it is when we think about sanctification or complete sanctification, uh, that God is the one that's accomplishing it and he will keep his word. No matter how far I am off the mark today, when Jesus comes, he'll take care of it. That does not mean just be careless today because he'll make up the difference then. No, we still are called on to be striving for it. And the, the, the impetus and the encouragement to do that is when we fall short and when we fail and when we don't try uh, to walk with God. Listen, he, he'll chasten us. He'll chasten us. But you know what? The desire of a loving, obedient child of God is to be like Jesus Christ. I believe this, that if we feel like God is pushing us to be like Christ and something we don't necessarily want, there's something wrong. Because even when I am the farthest from Christ at times in my life, in my heart, I desire to be walking with him. That no, none of us is above letting anger and bitterness creep into our life, hurts, wounds. None of us is above that. But no matter how bitter we can become, there ought to still be, there, there, for me, there's always still that desire all somebody has to say is something about how's your walk with God just to, just, to, uh, just to melt my heart because the child of God desires that when God challenges us to walk in a holy, consecrated way, it's not something that the heart of a Christian doesn't desire because we do desire it. We struggle to perform it, but we do desire it. We want to be right with God. We want to be more like Jesus Christ. Complete sanctification. 
Just that faithful promise in verse number 24, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. This idea of complete sanctification for the child of God is something that ought to be uh, in our hearts and minds all the time. And we, I want to challenge you to do a couple things. Number one, let God evaluate you where you are and let him tell you. Don't tell yourself, I think I'm doing pretty good because all we're doing is comparing ourselves among ourselves. Don't, uh, don't evaluate yourself. Let God evaluate you. And then whatever he tells you, act upon it. Act upon it. In other words, consecrate those areas of your life. Set apart those areas of your life to God's word and to prayer, to, to soul winning. Put away the bitterness, the wrath, the malice, and the anger, certainly blasphemy. And set ourselves apart wholly to God. And then trust God for the, for the outcome. Listen, we, there ought to be a pattern of growth. We ought to be able to chart, let God chart in our life our spiritual growth day to day, week to week, month to month. By God's grace, I am not what I used to be. Amen? Amen. But by God's grace, I'm not today what I shall be. For we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed. Complete sanctification. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Your whole spirit, soul, and body. That means your very life. It means physically everything, every way that you interact with this world through touch, taste, smell, sight, every way that you interact with this world and your spirit, which is very often your attitude, your thoughts, your, your temperament. We cannot just say, well, that's just the way I am. God knew I was this way when he saved me. No, no, he wants to make you like Jesus Christ. Our temperament, our attitude, completely yielding to him. Father, I pray that in this invitation time, we might do those things. We might let you examine us. We might act upon what you tell us and reveal to us. And we might trust you that you will sanctify us wholly. God, help us to make some progress in some one of those three areas, body, soul, or spirit, today. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed as we stand to our feet and the piano begins to play.